Okay, praise the Lord. Welcome everybody. Welcome today to this wonderful Wednesday. Amen. I'm coming to you today on the 19th of October. Unfortunately, uh, the last two weeks I wasn't able to come with the word. But anyway, I've got a wonderful word here today and you will be blessed even as you hear this word. Amen. You will be blessed. Uh, you know, God is always good as I always say. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And today I can guarantee you that you will be blessed even as you hear this word your life will never be the same again hallelujah so as you saw in the title i'm going to be speaking on the message entitled don't blame god amen but it will be deeper than that that's just like the title which i put so we'll, we'll, this is what we're going to look at this is what we're going to speak on okay so why do i say don't blame god because this is what happens with a lot of Christians. Myself also have once been there where uh, I'll be like, Oh Lord, why did you let that happen? Or you can even say, don't blame your father. Don't blame the heavenly father. Don't blame your father. Because at times something can happen. And you can very easily uh, start to blame your father. Blame your heavenly father. You blame the Lord. You'll be like, why did you let that happen? This is one of the most uh, common things. You know, I remember one person said to me, my mom passed away. Why did God let that happen? I prayed for her to be healed. Why did God let that happen? You know, and I explained to him to say, look, it's not like as if God let that thing happen. It's the enemy. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. And the father responds to faith. So even if we pray something, the law of the spirit doesn't change. We have to ask in faith. It's not like he's happy for that thing to happen. You understand this? I'll explain all this as we get into it and see how you can, you know, have a much more blessed life by taking the principles which I'm going to share here and getting understanding from it, okay? Because God responds to faith. He doesn't respond to tears. Many people at times, they cry and cry or complain and complain and whine and whine and say, why, Lord, why? If you're a good father, why did this thing happen? Why did that thing happen? And they just cry and cry. It's like if you have a baby that, that is in front of you and just cries and cannot speak and you're trying to say, what's the matter? If the baby tells you I'm hungry, then if you're the parent, you'll say, here's some food. You ask, isn't it? That's why even in Matthew 6, you know, the word of God tells us, which of you 
uh, being evil, you are speaking that time to the, the people at that time saying, if your son asks you for fish, will you give him a serpent? So he says, how much more your father in heaven? He says, if he asks you for bread, will you give him a stone? He says, how much more will your father in heaven give uh, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see this. So once we have the gift of God, which is the Holy Spirit in us, I tell you that you will overcome all of life's uh, troubles, tribulations, no matter what comes your way, you will prevail. Amen. But the most important thing is realize and understand that it, the Lord is not the one to blame. Your Heavenly Father is not the one to blame. Why? Because let's go to Romans 8. I'll just explain this. Okay. We're going to look at a few people in the Word of God who went through some stuff and had every right to be uh, offended against the Lord, offended against their Father, offended against God. But they did not become offended against God. Even though some were ignorant, as we'll look at it. But at the end of it all, they prevailed. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Look at this. I'll, take it from, I'll just take verse 28 for, for today. He says, and we know that all things, look at that. He said, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Let me explain this scripture. Not everything that happens does your heavenly father intend to happen. But whatever happens, the Lord says he will make all things work together for your good. You understand this? Like the common saying which they say, if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, isn't it? So it's like whatever comes out bitter towards you, the Lord turns it around for good. And we see this a wonderful example with Joseph in the Bible. Joseph, his brother, sold him into slavery and so on and so forth. They thought he was dead and all this. And at the end when they came and they thought Joseph was going to kill them after their father died. And Joseph said, no. You guys planned this for evil towards me, but the Lord meant it for good, isn't it? Let's see if we can get into that scripture. It's Genesis. Praise the Lord. You know, and Joseph had every right to say, Lord, you gave me those dreams that I'm going to be ruling the world. You know, it's like you gave me those dreams that I'm going to be ruling the world. And now I'm a slave. He could have become, he could have become uh, you know, angry and said, now I'm a slave and all this kind of thing. But Joseph continued. He continued. He could have become angry to say, but God, how can you let this happen? I've done nothing against you. And now Potiphar's wife uh, has, made, has framed me and I'm in prison. But he didn't become offended, isn't it? He kept on and he kept on and he kept on going. Amen. So let's look at this here. Thank you, Father. It should be verse number 50. Let's see if I can see. Sorry. Genesis. See if I can find this. Yeah. Genesis 50 verse number 20. So this was after his brothers. Uh, they became. Uh, they were sad against him. But let me take it from verse 18. It says. And his, his brethren. That's his brothers. Also went and fell down before his face. And they said. Behold we are your servants. And Joseph said unto them. Fear not. For am I in the place of God. Look at what Joseph said here. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is, as it is this day to save much people. So even though uh, Joseph's brothers were jealous of him and they wanted his destruction, but the Lord caused everything. He, t he, he made a way where there was no way. Like he says, he makes a way in the wilderness. He makes a way where there is no way. He leads you in the paths of righteousness. So it doesn't matter, no matter how dark the situation, no matter what the enemy has done to you, not what God has done, not what your heavenly father has done, but what the enemy has done to you. No matter what he does, the Lord will always make what? A way out. And why am I saying this, that no wicked will come upon you? Like, let's just have a look at it. James 1 verse 17, it says that, God is the Father of lights. That's our Heavenly Father. He says He doesn't change. Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning that what? He is good yesterday, today, and forever. Right? James 1 verse 17. Have a look at this. He says here, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So, let me explain this. The devil cannot bless anyone. Because the word blessing, it means a fine saying and benediction. So if whatever the, we know that whatever the devil says is a lie, whatever comes out of his mouth is a lie. So lies can never contain blessing. 
But you may say, oh, some people are wicked and they are seeing the blessing. No, that's not the blessing. You're just seeing some material something and it will end in tears. I can tell you that. But the father, when he speaks, he says that it is impossible for God to lie. And he speaks and he says that we are blessed. Matthew 5, Jesus sat and he dealt with almost every person's situation, no matter what they were going through. And he was like, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for they shall be filled, isn't it? Blessed are they, uh, you know, he went on and on. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He went on and on, releasing blessing, words of blessing. So every good gift, it only comes from the Heavenly Father, isn't it? It comes from our Father. So you can never blame God for anything evil that happens against you because he cannot do evil. He cannot, especially to his children. Especially to his children. There's these wrong doctrines about desert periods where it's like, oh, God will put you first in a trial or testing a desert period. No, 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 no. That has been used wrongly. I'm not saying the Lord cannot train up someone. He trains up someone, but he trains them up in love. He doesn't put them through hardship. Even the children of Israel who were so wicked, they had manna. <laughs> they had manna from heaven. They had, uh, they had meat from heaven. Even though they cried and groaned and complained, they had water from a rock. Isn't it? They even received all the spoils of Egypt. And Egypt was the wealthiest, uh, the wealthiest nation at that time. Praise the Lord. Egypt was the wealthiest nation at that time. And they took all the wealth of Egypt with them from slaves as they were set free. So this is what the Lord does. He only has good plans for you. We see it even in the, the Old Testament where, they were, they were, where there was no access to this grace which we have now. We see the likes of David, how they received the goodness of God. People who did wickedness and they received blessing. Look at Cain for an example. Cain killed his brother Abel, isn't it? And he was like, his sin was so bad and all this. But the Lord still said, who, he said, whoever touches Cain, I will avenge sevenfold, isn't it? Even though Cain was a murderer, but even under the Old Testament, the Lord was like, I still have got protection. I still have got love for Cain. Now look at that. So realize that if anything bad happens in your life, don't blame your heavenly father. If anything seems to be not moving, don't blame him. He's not responsible. I'll, I'll show you as we go along. So look at this. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, Isaiah chapter 4 verse number 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isn't it? And he says, if you reject knowledge, I reject you. So it's like the Lord is saying, you don't, if you don't know um, what is going on, if you don't know your rights, then you can actually perish. You don't know what is yours in Christ. You don't know that Jesus became poor, that you might become rich. You don't know that by you speaking life, you can change the situation. Not by crying tears and saying, God, heal me. But by you understanding what 1 Peter 2.24 says, that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, you were healed. Not you are going to be healed. So when you pray, you don't pray and say, Lord, heal me. If you've got any sickness or feeling because or whatever, bad feeling. Or whatever diagnosis, because that's a lie. You don't say, Lord, heal me. You say, thank you, Father, that you healed me 2,000 years ago. And I received that healing and I will see it come to pass in my life, isn't it? This is what you do. He's a good father. I'll show you. Don't worry. Let's just go. And First John, it says that there's no darkness in God. No darkness. Darkness has to deal with pain, sorrow, uh, poverty. You know, I think I have to bring more word because these past two weeks I've been off. But I haven't been online uh, coming to you live. But you need to get this word and understand that the Father loves you. Let's look at this. First John 5. What am I? Verse number 5. First John 1. Sorry. First John 1. Verse number 5. If you love someone, you, you do everything in your power to bless them and move things along. Look like in a relationship. Okay, let's read the scripture first. <laughs> 1 John 1 verse 5. He says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, right? Which and which we declare unto you that God is light. So this is what I'm here to say to you. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's no darkness in the Father. There's no darkness, meaning there's no bad side. There's no evil in him towards you, especially towards his children. There's no evil. He says he causes his son to rise and, and his reign to come and on what are the plans even of the wicked people you understand this he even has a desire for them that's why john 3 16 what does it say it says for god so loved the world now when he's saying the world he's not speaking of people in the world he's speaking of the world which is the unsaved people 
He loved them so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not what, perish but have everlasting life. So this is the design. So how can we point a finger? Or how can we ever come to have it in our heart to say, ah, God is not helping me, he's not blessing my business, I prayed for this thing. No, the Lord responds to faith. If you prayed and something didn't happen, what did he say in Luke chapter 18? Remember, he, said, he gave us the story of the widow. He said the widow kept going to the church. And the judge was a wicked judge. But he said, yet because this widow kept on coming to the judge, the judge said, I better deal with this widow's case. Even though I'm wicked and I have no concern for God or for people. But because this widow is making me tired by continually knocking, knocking, knocking every time, saying, deal with my case. He said, I'll deal with the case. And then Jesus said, if this is what a wicked, unjust judge says about someone continually coming to him, he says, how much more? How about your heavenly father? He says that he will answer you speedily, isn't it? So you have to pray for things to change. You cannot quit and just give up when something happens uh, the first time something falls. You know, look at people like Moses, what they went through. Like I just showed you Joseph, Abraham. He believed God. He didn't stop praying. He didn't stop and say, oh, can you stop talking to me? I'm still waiting for this son, Isaac, you told me about. Now I'm, and now I'm 100 years old. Please leave me alone. No, he didn't do that. He believed God, even though he didn't see it. He believed God and he continued. He didn't become offended to say, oh, this promise of yours, can you stop just talking about this? I haven't seen it. No, it says that what? It says that he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The Lord said, ah, this is the right thing which he's doing, isn't it? And he saw the blessing. So this is what I'm saying to you as well. Whatever's coming, whatever challenge you have in your life, never get to a point where you think the Lord is to blame or the Father is to blame. He's not involved in bringing wickedness upon you. He's not involved in bringing depression upon you. You know, when we speak of chastisement, you know, in Hebrews, it speaks of chastisement. But the chastisement which the Lord does, because even in Hebrews, he says that we have had fathers of our flesh, meaning we've had natural parents who chastised us because they were wanting to relieve their anger or something. And there were some, they were actually enjoying it. Isn't it? But he says, when your father chastises you, meaning when your father corrects you, he's giving you guidance and direction. And he says that it brings out the peaceable fruit of righteousness afterwards. So he corrects you in a gentle way when he says, no, my son, no, my daughter, you're going down the wrong way. This is not your destiny. This is not your thing. You will know it in a gentle way. He corrects you. You understand this? It's just like how a, a, a horse is, is guided. Like I always say to the guys in the rural areas, you know, the whip which is used, it's not meant to be for whipping like the donkeys and that. It's just meant to be the crack of the whip which causes the animal to move. But you find people beating up the... <laughs> whipping the poor donkey or whacking the poor horse. It's not that even the reins. It's not for you to pull hard and like this here. It's just for a gentle tug, isn't it? So the father, that's why even he said, don't be like the horse, isn't it? He said, don't be like the mule, isn't it? He said, just, just hear my word. Allow my voice to guide you and you'll see the blessing. Isn't it? When we have lack of knowledge, this is when uh, we tend to blame God and say, why did that happen? Why? He said, don't go that direction. Then you bump your head and you cry and point a finger at him. No, it's like a child with a hot stove. You, you know, even a babe, you tell them, chichi, chichi, don't touch, chichi. Then the child realizes, okay, chichi, I don't touch. But if the child goes and put the hand, now they come shout at the, at the parent to say, hey, I burned my hand. So yes, and the parent will still come and say, okay, let me help you. Let's, let's put a bandage on your hand. This is how the father is. But don't now think that he is to blame for like our mistakes, your mistake. He's never to blame. Amen. So there it is. And John 10, 10, one of my favorites, which I always uh, like to read. It explains because Jesus came and told us the story why he came. John 10, 10, he said, The thief does not come except for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So Jesus has come for you to have life and life more abundantly. So there's no way that you can ever be like upset against him because his plans for you, like he said in Jeremiah 29, 11, is to prosper you and give you an expected definite end, isn't it? You know, so this is the goodness of God. You get this. Like I said, it's like in a relationship. Remember the one time I recall I preached on the mystery of marriage and I preached on how saying that the Lord is your husband, he's your maker. So it's like in a relationship, you know, people will say, oh, in a relationship, no one is perfect. And this person has their shortfalls and that person, and you got to work it out as you go. Okay. You're talking about carnal men. But now when we're talking of a relationship, <laughs> 
with the Lord Almighty Jesus Christ, the, the, the Father of Light, who said that, who, who himself said, Be you perfect as I am perfect, isn't it? And we know that God is love and love is the bond of perfection. So when we speaking of our relationship with our father, he's our father and he is our husband as well as we are the bride of, of Christ. We are dealing with perfection, meaning that he's always right, meaning that he doesn't make a mistake. You understand this? So if there's ever an issue in the relationship, majority of the time, it's our side which we have to put in order. Once you do that, I tell you, you will have a blessed relationship with your father. Hallelujah. So what I want to show you is that, like what I was explaining at the start, when you say, okay, well, yeah, God is powerful. He can make changes and that. Why didn't he step in and all this? Understand this. Let's say you own a property, right? You own a house. If you lease that house out, if you rent that house out uh, to someone, that person is now the tenant of that house or of that commercial property, whatever, which you own, but you have given it to them for the lease period. You cannot now just come with your keys, walking in the house in the middle of the night saying, oh, I'm just checking up on my property, how everything is. That, that, that is against the, the agreement, isn't it? You can't just go to that business if someone has a restaurant and you're like, well, I just want to paint the restaurant now, even though you're renting my property, but I just want to do some painting and renovations. You cannot do that. Why? Because you have leased out that property. You have rented it out to that person who is a tenant or whatever it is. So even so, with the earth, the Lord says that he has given it over. He says the earth is for the children of men, isn't it? He says that those that be blessed of him, Psalms 37, says they shall inherit the earth. He says the earth is our inheritance. It's, he's given this for us to rule and reign as kings, yeah, as royalty on the earth. So now if the Lord says, this is your domain, this is your kingdom, how this is your, your dwelling place, he cannot just come. Like he said, he's given you free choice. He cannot just come now and make interventions on anything. He can't just walk into the house even though he's got the keys and say, because he's got the agreement, he says, no, this I've given to, to my sons, to my daughters. This is the inheritance, this is their place. You have to invite him in, isn't it? Let me show you the scripture. So when something's happening in your life, he can't just come and make a change or whatever. But we have to be the ones who say, Father, can you intervene here? We need help here. If you sit and cry, he's going to just watch and say, oh, what can I do? But you have to speak. He doesn't violate his principles. Like I always teach Christians and I say, the law of giving and receiving, of sowing and reaping applies whether someone is a Christian, born again, speaking in tongues or not. That's how you can find someone who's an unbeliever, a heathen, but they are mightily blessed. Why? Because they give, they pay their workers on time. And the Lord will make sure their business will never die down because that person is providing for many families and many people. You get this. So we have to follow those principles and be blessed. Okay, I said Psalms 115. Thank you, Father. Verse number 16. Right. He says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. So the earth has been given to us. The, the earth has been given to us, to the children of men. So this is our, like I said, it's like he's listed out. Jesus even explained the parable of the vineyard. He said a certain man owned a vineyard and he, he gave it out to some stewards to look after it, isn't it? And then he sent messengers to check you. Speaking of the prophets, and they killed the messengers. Then he says, last of all came the son and they killed the son. Then they said, what do you think the father will do when he comes? He said, well, the, the father will take care of those uh, those hired servants and put it to someone else. But we are not servants. He was explaining that at that time before the cross to the Pharisees. Now we are sons. And he says he has given us this earth for us to what? To enjoy. Praise the Lord. So he can't just come in and intervene. It's like if you give your son a business and you say, son, oh, I have many businesses, but I'm giving you this business to run. You can't now come and just start making decisions. It's your son's thing. Let him do it, isn't it? You can't just jump in. So the same is with the father. Your life, like, you know, I've heard this quote many times, and it says that our life, where we are in our life, is the sum total of all the decisions we've made in, mind, in life. Decision, small decisions, thoughts, becomes words, becomes actions, becomes habits, becomes bigger decisions, and it shapes a pattern for our life. So the Lord can't just intervene. He, he follows as we go. He'll, of course, he'll always pour out his love and give direction. He's divine. He'll, you know, 
try and usher you into the right way, but we choose at the end of it all. Isn't it? Like this week I was counseling a, a one young man and he was telling me the Lord spoke to him about this lady and all this kind of thing. And he was like, so before he even told me that, I began to speak to him on the issue of marriage and saying that, you know, there's an issue of choice. It's not just like, if that's what God says. I said, both parties have to agree. And then that's when he began to confess and say, and say, oh, I was praying about this and the Lord showed me this lady and she was like not quite interested. So he understood from there. What am I saying? Is that you have got choice. Even in your life, if you want to choose, no, regardless of if the Lord destines you for something, but he will always say, I've destined you for this. This is where your blessing is. Follow this way. But we have the choice. You have the choice. If you want to wear red or if you want to wear blue. These are the choices he has. So we can't blame the Lord at times if we step out and make the wrong decision and then we bump our head. But what I'm saying is even if you step out, make the wrong decision, bump your head, the Father will come and cause that thing to turn around and work together for your good. So we can never be offended at him. We can never blame him for any wrong. Like I said to you, he is perfect. He is love and love is the bond of perfection. So in this relationship, he's never wrong. He's never wrong. He doesn't fail. Love never fails. So he's never wrong. So it's just up to us to check, to say, okay, where have I missed it? Help me. Just say, help me, Father. Help me, Lord. And you say, oh, maybe you say, okay, pray, declare something. Then you pray on that thing. You declare something. Matthew 18, another one. Let's have a look. Like I'm saying to you, you can't intervene in something. So it's important not to just sit when things are going against you or something's bad and say, God, why is this happening in my life? I'm tired of this. So I'm suffering. And when is this going to happen? No. What we have to do is we have to speak the word of God. We have to pray. We have to ask the Holy Spirit, ask our Father to, to intervene, declare, say, let the change come. Then he comes with the power, backs up our words. Hallelujah. And makes the change. So let's go to Matthew 17, Matthew 18, sorry. Zi ala Verse number 18. Look what it says here. It says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you bind on earth. Does it say whatsoever God binds? No. It says, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So when we pray, when we declare, when we speak things and we make an agreement and a change here, it's established in the spirit. And then it, it's established on earth, isn't it? You know, like I remember the one time I was listening to, it was a minister of God pray, And pray said, Lord, we send angels to win souls. I was like, what? We send the angels to win souls and bring them to church. I was like, no, 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 no. Mark 16, what did Jesus say? He said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the prayer is to raise up preachers, to raise up ministers of the gospel. And then now the ministers, the evangelists, the preachers have to get up off their rear end and go and preach the gospel. That's how souls get saved. The angel will be sitting there like, I must preach the gospel. Although the word of God does say an angel can preach the gospel, many people have had angels appear to them. But it's not their authority, it's not their jurisdiction. Remember, he says that the angels are what? Are ministering spirits for us. So we can declare unto them, the angel is not going to go and, and hold a crusade and start preaching the gospel. No, the angel is waiting for the instruction of the word of God. As we as sons of God go and minister and preach the word wherever we preach in whatever platform like this, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, Instagram, through books, through media, through whatever method the Lord gives you to use. As we, he says, how will they hear except they, how, how will they hear except there is a preacher? So we have to bring the word. Isn't it? When we bring the word, this is when people can respond to the word and angels can act upon the word and the Holy Spirit himself can act upon the word. When we say blessing upon this person, life upon this person, isn't it? That's when things will come. Jesus said to his disciples, you go and preach the gospel. He didn't say, okay, guys, go and pray. Send the angels. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for angels to do something. They can do something. But the angel will be waiting on you. You can have mighty angels. Many people, like he says, you have ministering spirits. They, they are ready on standby. Some angels are just like on off. They're just like, just like sleeping around. Saying, this guy, he doesn't even want us to go and get his blessing. He doesn't even, he's just sitting. When is he going to speak and, and, and declare some things, isn't he? But when you begin to pray, 
even in tongues, when you begin to declare things, those angels get up and they start working and causing things to happen. Look at all these lockdowns which happened. The, the, the agenda of these guys was for, this, for churches never to, to open up freely again. Imagine, no communion, all this kind of thing. Lockdown and all this kind of thing. But now, praise the Lord. How do you think that happened? It wasn't because of peer, it wasn't because of pressure. It wasn't because of uh, the masses uh, uh, protesting or what. If anything, the protests and all that were ignited by the Holy Ghost. They were ignited by the prayer of the saints, which caused things to change in the spirit. Everything happens in the spirit. So when something goes wrong, address it in the spirit. Start from the spirit. Don't point a finger and say, oh, well, God, you're responsible. You know, it's like, uh, I remember, like there's a Japanese proverb. It says, the fish rots from the head. You know, and it's something where people say, it's like uh, John Maxwell has a teaching and he says, if you get into an organization and you find something wrong, fire the head, fire the leader. In other words, point the blame on the one who's at the top. So now, this is what some people do. They're like, oh, well, um, the one with the greatest power and greatest responsibility is, is, is my heavenly father, is God. So, God, why did you let that happen? No, that's not how it happens. You are the head and you are the leader of your life, of your destiny. The Lord has given you life as a gift. He is there to help you, but he's given you life as what? As a gift. So, you just have to bind something on earth and it's bound in heaven. Isn't it? This is what you do. So let's have a look at one of these guys who had every right. Oh, can I, I can't really say every right, but let's just say they could have had a cause to be offended, to blame God, to be angry at God. One of those was Job. Job or Job, however you want to say. So anyway, what happened with Job is that he was so fearful. You know, many times I'd hear it preached to me uh, when I was growing up that read the story of Job. God took everything away from him. <laughs> Killed his whole family and everything. You know, or, or others would say, he let the devil uh, attack Job in every way, except for his life, and then he restored to him afterwards. And that's not what happened. What happened is Job had fear. Because when the enemy came and approached the Lord and was like, hey, um, have you, Job, whatever, and the Lord said, have you seen my servant Job, how excellent he is, he was a prosperous guy and all this. And then the enemy, the devil was like, yeah, but you've put a, you've blessed him mightily and you've put a, and um, take something away from him and see what will happen. And then the Lord was like, you know, he didn't respond to that. Then the, then the enemy was like, you have put a hedge of protection around him. So it's like the enemy has tried to get to him. And then the Lord said, all that is there is in your hands. What God was saying was the reality to say that because of Job's fear, because of um, his confessions, if you read in Job 1, he would offer sacrifices almost daily for his children, saying maybe they've cursed God and they might die. Let me offer sacrifices to them. Even when um, his entire family died and he lost everything, in Job chapter 3, he says, those things, let's read it, that I greatly feared have come to pass. Isn't it? Mark, I show, it was Job 3 somewhere there. Man, does he? Job 3, is it verse 9? Okay, Job 3 verse 25. Look at this. He says, uh, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. So it was Job's fear which caused the destruction. But even despite the destruction, the man didn't curse God. Even though it was, we can say, he was majorly responsible for, for everything going wrong in his life. But he never cursed the Lord. You see this, he never cursed the Lord. He had an opportunity, his wife, look at this, Job 2 verse 9. His wife said, while well, the wife was still alive, the wife later died. Says, then said his wife unto him, do you still remain in integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. What shall we receive good at the end of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did Job not sin, a, sin with his lips. So this was ignorance. When Job said we've received good from God, we also receive evil. It was his ignorance, right? But the most important thing is that Job never became angry with the Lord. He didn't speak against him. He wasn't offended against him. He was like, if this is it, so be it. I'll still praise God, isn't it? Even when his friends came, they told him the same thing. They were like, curse God and die and all this. And can't you see? You? Then they were like, okay, if you don't want to curse God, you must have sinned and done something wrong. And Job was like, I don't know what it is, but I'll keep trusting God. Even like Job 13 verse 15. This was another form of, you know, Job's ignorance when he, he said this. And I've heard many people quote it, but not understanding, you know. 
It's even like in Job 1 where he said, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No, the Lord didn't take away. It's the enemy who took away from him. Look at this, Job 13, 15. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. Even though Job spoke this in ignorance, he spoke this under the influence of the Holy Ghost. It's, when I say ignorance, I'm meaning that Job was saying that even if the Lord kills me, I'll still praise him. Isn't it? God is not out to kill you. As we saw there, Jesus said in John 10, 10, that he has come that we may have life and have it what? More abundantly. Isn't it? But most important, what I'm saying is that Job stood steadfast, despite him becoming like a vagabond from being the wealthiest person in the land to losing his entire family and becoming a vagabond. He maintained a, a, a faithful confession. He maintained that God is good. He maintained, even though he, he thought God was bad, he was like, well, if God has taken it, God has taken it. If God wants me to die, then he's, he's going to make me die. You know, he was like, whatever happens, I, I will not speak against the Lord, isn't it? And in the end of it all, the Lord brought restoration and Job received double of all that he lost. So what I'm showing you is that we can't blame God. Even yet, there's a wonderful book here. And that was even a prophetic when he said, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. You're speaking like, you know, prophetically of Jesus and all this, quite deep. But most importantly, despite everything that Job went through, even though he didn't know it was the devil and he thought that it was God, but he still didn't speak against the Lord. You see this. So he had an opportunity, as you can say, to to blame God, to point a finger and say, oh, well, uh, I'm no more going to church because I sowed a seed last time and I didn't see my harvest yet. And I asked God for that business to prosper. Or I asked him for marriage. By now I'm not married. So you see, this is what happens. People become offended with God. Or oh, I'm preaching in my church and no one is giving. No one acknowledges me. I've worked so hard for God all these years and I'm walking. No. <laughs> that is not the Lord. The Lord is not doing those things. He's not responsible for that. We have to, as children of God, as he says, he's given us this earth for us. He's given us this life. We have to pray and say, Lord, let there be a change in this situation. Let people acknowledge me for what I've done. Let me see the fruit of my labor. Isn't it? The seeds that I've sown. And you'll see it. Another person we can look at is... Uh, let me just fix this mic. So another person we can look at is David, right? First Samuel chapter 30. David... Another amazing man of God. He had so he did a couple of stuff wrong, but he was always so quick to repent. And the Lord said, This is a man after my own heart, isn't it? So David, they were in battle. David was always in battle, it seems, but he won many battles. Let's read verse 30. What happened? It says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burnt it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They didn't kill, they slew them, not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burnt with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. So this is what happened. David and the, and the men were away. When they came back, they found uh, the entire place burnt with fire. You know, like uh, often you people say, who's burning fire? You know, fire you don't burn fire, fire burns, okay. But anyway, the city was burnt with fire here. Yeah, you get this. So it's like they came and they're like, the place has been ransacked. Our families are gone and all our property is gone. It's like everything was gone and destroyed. You see, they were like, it was an ambush when they were away. It says, so David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burnt with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. This is a great loss. Can you imagine then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have a look at that. Can you imagine someone crying? You know, like I've been to funerals where like people cry and all that kind of thing. But have a look at this here. It says that at this point in time, um, David and his men, they cried and cried till they had no more power left to cry. And you know, I've been, like I'm saying, I've been to like funerals and that, and I've seen like people when they lose a loved one, how they cry and cry and like, is this person going to stop crying? You know, and they'll cry and cry and eventually the crying will die down and then they sleep or something. But yeah, it's like they cried till they had no more even strength to cry. It says, and David's two wives were taken captive, right? That one and that one, verse six. And David was greatly distressed. 
So now David was very stressed. Imagine he cried and cried. But David, even the other soldiers and men with him cried and cried. But then he was very stressed now. Why? For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved and every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So look at this. Remember what I said to you? Whenever something goes wrong in a place, organization or something, the first person who gets the blame is the leader. Like how people, they say, well, if my life is also messed up, I've done everything, it must be God. It must be the father to blame. So the same thing happened here. David and his army and his men, they were together coming from wherever they were coming in the battle. David wasn't part of the plan for the evil. David himself was crying to say, we've been ransacked, we've been, we've been robbed, we've been looted. Our places, our, our, our spoils have been taken and our families are gone. He himself was sad, but the men were also sad. But they didn't think that David is not involved. They were like, we're going to stone him now. So now David is facing a thing where he's a leader. And they're like, okay, there's no one else to blame. We're blaming you. Now David could have easily turned and said, God, I've done everything you told me to do. Now these people want to kill me. I'm sad. I've lost everything myself. He had every opportunity in this case to point the finger and say, Lord, why did you let this happen? How is this going to happen? But look what it says. It says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know, it's like he encouraged himself. He reminded himself. David was a psalmist. Maybe he sang a psalm. In fact, you can read in the psalms when David was facing these issues, the words which he would speak out. My soul has been what? And all this, restore me, O Lord. All the stuff he says. Look at it. Verse 7. What did he do? What did he do next? And David said to Abiata, the priest, Abimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither an ephod. And Abiata brought uh, the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So this is what the Lord does. David could have cried. He could have been stoned and killed by his men. You, you get this? For what had taken place and all this kind of thing. David could have pointed a finger and said, Oh God, why did you let this happen? Now the people are going to kill me. Oh, let them kill me. But he encouraged himself in God. He realized the Lord is good. He realized God is good. He is sovereign. He knew the heart of God. He knew that even no matter what is happening, God cannot, can make a way out. That's why he went forward. He first encouraged himself in God. Then he went to the priest and then he prayed to the Lord. He said, what do I do? So when we face a situation, when things are not moving, it's not to point a finger at the Lord or to say, why is this happening? Or to cry. It's to inquire of him. Lord, what should I do? This is what David did. He said, Lord, what should I do? The people want to kill me. We've lost everything. And the Lord said, go after the enemy. Pursue. <laughs> so continue in that project. Continue in that thing which the enemy has told you you will fail. Get back up again. That loss, whatever you've had. Get back up because the Lord said you will recover all. And verse number 17. He went with the men. Some of the men were weak. They couldn't continue because they were so hungry and faint. But the ones who went, they brought the victory. Let's read it in uh, 1 Samuel 30 verse 17. It says, And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And they escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all. God is able to make all things work together for good. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. Right? And there was, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Isn't it? And then after this, they even shared the spoil of what they recovered with the men who didn't come into battle. So that's another testimony, like what Jesus says, one is victory for you. You receive it. Even if you are not at the cross, you are not crucified. You receive the benefit. Hallelujah. You receive the benefits of the kingdom of God. You are a citizen of heaven. So this was David. He saw the goodness of God. He had every chance to say, God, why did you let that happen? I'm out there fighting battles for you, defending the people from the time I killed Goliath. Now the people want to kill me. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He went and he praised God. And then he said, he prayed. Then after praising, he prayed him, I believe. He prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, what must I do? And he said, go and recover. And he said, okay, Lord, I will go and recover. And he went and he re recovered. So whatever you face, you're going to ask the Lord, what do I do in this situation? Let's look at one last guy. I want to show you. This is the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul Ministered the gospel all over, mighty miracles, everything. 
majority of his time he was actually in jail being persecuted or whatever now at this one point in time he had been preaching the gospel and he was falsely accused and he was in bondage and in a trap but look what happened when he's testifying whilst in chains testifying he says uh, acts 24 i'll take it from uh, verse 16 he says and here in do i exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward god and toward men hallelujah so look at this this was the apostle paul as a prisoner testifying i think it was before felix at the time who was the ruler and he says i have put it in myself to have a heart to have a mind to have a conscience which has no offense towards men and even more importantly towards god so it's like the apostle paul had no offense towards god he could have had every right to say oh, but god i'm preaching your gospel now i'm in prison what's going on you said the blessing is upon me if i if i if i'm a minister and all this kind of thing you know he could have said all this but he didn't he continued in it and he continued declaring the goodness of the lord despite everything that he was facing and then amazingly after felix heard this on this trial verse number 23 Let's take it from verse number 22. It says, "And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias the chief captain shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter." So he wanted to hear Paul again. Then verse 23, what I want to note on. He says, "And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, which means freedom, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come unto him." So look at this. So the apostle Paul was in chains he was in prison for this trial but now after he testified before Felix and he's like I'm not angry with God I'm not angry with man I'm just a minister of the gospel to preach the gospel look what he says he says after that Felix then put him a centurion is like a top ranking uh, army official so he was like staying with that army official and he said give him liberty so he was sort of like now under house arrest not in a prison and he said give him freedom for all what he wants and he stayed like that i think it was for 2 years isn't it so he saw restoration job saw restoration david saw restoration paul saw restoration by not being angry or pointing a finger at god or blaming god It's only through lack of knowledge that someone will point a finger and blame the Lord. Like I said to you, he is perfect. He says as for God, his way is perfect, isn't it? So what should we do if we are facing an issue? Like I said, you have to get the Lord involved. Don't point a finger at him and say why. Stand up, get up and act in faith. Like James 5, I just want to show you. We we'll look at uh, three things. James 5 Marcus Zubres Elevratos Kendemlisha I think it's verse 13. Yeah, verse number 13. It says, "Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms." So if you are afflicted, you have to pray. Like he said, look 18, you can go read it. When you're facing affliction, pray and the Lord will bring a change. Don't cry or grumble and complain and say, "God, why?" and whatever it is. As well as if we go to Matthew 7, 7. Jesus said, "Ask and you shall receive," isn't it? "Knock and the door shall be open on to you i'm sure it's matthew 7 7 so if you're not asking or knocking if you ask and knock before keep on asking keep on knocking matthew 7 7 ask and it shall be given unto you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you for every one that asks receives and he that seeks finds and to him that knocks it shall be opened god is good he is faithful every time he is faithful throughout he is perfect he is perfect he is perfect regardless of what happens You know, because what the enemy wants is he wants you to become offended with God, to mess up your relationship with the Lord, to say, "Why did God give me this wife? Why did God give me this husband?" That's all he wants, and he wants you to point a finger at the Lord. And then he knows, "Aha! Now his re- the relationship is messed up with the perfect one, with the all-powerful, ever-living God. I've put a span in the works." No, realize God is on your side. God is perfect. I think I need to preach that message that God is on your side. He only has a good desire for you. Let's look at um John chapter 16, the last scripture. Marka zebra do sekei. He says, "Ask and your joy shall be full." Isn't it? John chapter 16 verse number 24. He says, "Here the two meaning up to now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy shall be full." So despite any challenge whatever you face, or whatever comes your way just know that god is on your side i think that should be the next message god is on your side it's not against you he's not trying to teach you a lesson with evil or anything he's a good father father of lights 
he blesses and doesn't curse. What he says shall come to pass. It's just up to us to say, Father, you've given me this life to enjoy. I need your intervention in this situation. Come and take charge. He doesn't, he's a gentleman. He doesn't just come in and intervene and say, okay, I'm going to do this. No. When we speak, pray for your business, pray for your family, pray for your marriage, pray for your children, pray for whatever you want to see in life. Keep on praying, keep on declaring, hear his word, let him guide you and see the goodness of God. Hallelujah. He is on your side. If anything, you blame the devil because he is the father of lies. Even if you make a mistake, you blame the devil for deceiving you. After that, you get back up on your feet. The Holy Spirit is there to help you and to, to keep you in, in a blessed way. Hallelujah. So thank you for hearing this. I'm pretty sure you are blessed. If you haven't received Christ, uh, say the prayer to follow. Hallelujah. And you can contact me there. Uh, giving information is there. Uh, whatever, if you need prayer requests and all that, all the details to follow. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. I love you, but your Heavenly Father loves you even. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, follow, subscribe, and share, word and share this message. If you're not sure about your salvation, you're not sure if you're saved, say the prayer to follow. The greatest miracle is salvation. Lift up your hands and your hands to heaven. Hallelujah. And just say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Today, today, I've heard your word. I've heard your word. And I believe. And I believe that you are the Son of God. That you are the Son of God. I believe. I believe that you love. That you died for me. That you rose from the dead for me. And I take you, Jesus, as my Lord, as my God, as my King, as my Savior. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh.